Dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this satellite symposium, supported from, uh, very kindly from uh, Concept Medical. We have uh, a number of esteemed uh, guests and speakers. Uh, there's going to be a wide discussion on the use of serovimus in the arteriovenous uh, fistula and arteriovenous graft space. Uh, uh, I'm going to move uh, straight away to our first uh, speaker, uh, and I will be inviting Alok Finn from Gettersburg to be presenting on the potential advantages of serolimus of opacritaxel in the arteriovenous fistula space. Let's move on to the first talk, please. Hi, I'm Alok Finn. I'm going to talk to you about treatment of a fistula with DCBs, advantage of serolimus over paclitaxel. Here are my disclosures. So, as a way of introduction, following observations from traumatic arteriovenous fistulas caused by mechanical injuries, this paper was published in 1996, in which these authors first described the creation of a radial to cephalic AV fistula in the forearm, forming a side-to-side -side anastomosis between cephalic vein and radial artery. And really, at this point, they revolutionized the care for hemodynamic patients uh, going forward. Despite the introduction of new fistula surgical techniques and locations, over the last 54 years of AV fistula are uh, mired by high primary failure rates, and the pathophysiology of stenosis in AV fistula and AV grafts is very different from that after angioplasty. It really is believed that ongoing needle internal hyperplasia and proliferation of AV fistulas and AV grafts is due to really flow disturbances that occur in the areas of the anastomosis of a high pressure system into a low pressure system, that is the artery into the vein. And mechanical factors also contribute to, uh, contributed to ongoing needle hyperplasia, including repetitive needle punctures, et cetera. It's amazing the cost of maintaining vascular access. It's estimated that uh, the uh, cost of treating a patient with a failure of hemodialysis access graft is significantly higher, $62,000 per year than the cost of treating a patient who does not have access graft failure. And there are multiple percutaneous techniques and tools that have been developed. At best, secondary patency of arterial venous grafts, actually patency after intervention is 50% at three years after the creation of the vascular access, and typically multiple interventions are required. You can see here drug-coated balloons for AV fistula. In the United States, really, there's two FDA-approved products. One's the Impact L uh, device, as well as the Lutonix device. Both are paclitaxel-coated balloons. And you can see here on the uh, pivotal trial shown on the bottom for the uh, Medtronic device, as well as for the Lutonix device, uh, the data was uh, enough to get approval. Now, why do we need a serolimus DCB? Well, serolimus is a standard, as you all know, for coronary artery disease treatment via DES. It's very safe and effective. Paclitaxel modifications, such as the crystalline uh, conversion of paclitaxel, mean the coating integrity and transfer are variable with substantial portion of this lost into downstream tissues in the blood, as well as downstream organs. Loss of paclitaxel in the body remains a significant safety concern, which was further exacerbated by the Katsadonis meta-analysis, which was published in JAHA a number of years ago. And these are some examples of slow flow, as well as downstream emboli found after uh, percutaneous treatment uh, with paclitaxel DCBs, either in the lower extremities or the coronary region. The Swede pad analysis came out in New England Journal last year, and although it was comforting, they said that there was the data was limited by the FDA, so there was not entirely, uh, totally uh, extinguishing concerns about the use of pack about the use of paclitaxel balloons. And the dose of paclitaxel is shown here. It's a significant amount of paclitaxel that's delivered in these long balloons that are used for different types of treatment of peripheral artery disease. And as you know, a lot of paclitaxel is lost into the body. Here, the serolimus offers potential benefits over paclitaxel, and I won't review this in detail, but as we discussed before, it is the most widely used uh, agent for coronary uh, DES, as well as um, uh, other areas such as transplant. Better safety margin, better anti resonotic impact, although it does have uh, problems with tissue absorption and retention. And that's really where we have to make overcome these technical t challenges with serolimus. We have to enhance tissue absorption, that is get the drug into the tissues and then ex uh, extend its tissue retention. And the magic touch solution really does that by using phospholipid particles, which encapsulate serolimus and allow it to transfer more efficiently and stay there over time. And that's shown here in this uh, arterial wall PK analysis done in the coronary after magic touch in the ISR model, showing you that there is significantly more 
uh, pacl uh, serolimus sina arterial tissues even out to 60 days. 28-day histology in this ISR model is shown here. You can see the magic touch solution versus POBA of an instant restenosis in the pig coronary artery shows essentially very good histological response with no evidence of toxicity or inflammatory, severe inflammatory response. And that is shown here as well in terms of this study. There was increased amounts of fibrin seen in the magic touch, but otherwise uh, there were no untoward effects. The AV fistula model is commonly used for approval, and you can see here it consists of making an anastomosis between the uh, vein, uh, iliac artery, and the iliac vein in an animal model, and that's shown in the close-up gross image on the right. You can see when we look at histological markers of safety and efficacy, we look at endothelial loss, interstructs, muscle cell density, fibrin deposition, medial smooth muscle loss, and proteoglycan collagen replacement. All of these are markers of drug effect. You can see we can also do downstream sand sampling for pathology assessment to look at downstream embolic effects. Here is an example of the AV fistula model done for a paclitaxel eluting DCB in the swine model. Here I'm showing you the copoba versus the DCB model. You can see there's some residual fibrin deposition in the downstream distal vein, as well as some in the arteries seen in the DCB model. Well, the magic touch solution in 60 days is shown here, showing excellent results without any evidence of significant toxicity, uh, good arterial healing response overall. So in conclusion, serolimus is the preferred drug for intravascular interventions. Paclitaxel balloons are limited by high rate of visceral embolization and loss of paclitaxel in the body. These were further heightened by the consanos meta-analysis. The magic touch serolimus coated balloon demonstrates safety and successful drug transfer for the arterial wall out to 60 days. The ISR study at 30 days in the porcine model showed no evidence of toxicity. I believe this is a promising new technology for the treatment of AV fistula and AV graft stenosis. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Aloka. Uh, we're going to be discussing a lot about the key differences between Seroimus and Pacritaxel at the final stage of, of this uh, symposium. Now I'm going to hand over to my uh, co-moderator, Dr. Jun Tang from Singapore. Uh, Jun will be presenting the results, the one-year outcomes from the Matilda trial. Jun, back to you. A very good afternoon from Singapore. Um, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to present the 12-month uh, outcomes from the Matilda study. These are my disclosures relevant to this talk. So the Magic Touch Intervention Leap for Dialysis Access uh, primary objective was to evaluate the six-month and one-year outcomes of the Magic Touch Serolimus coated balloon angioplasty to rescue dysfunctional arterial venous fistulas. These are the study endpoints of interest, including a safety endpoint, access circuit patency at both three and six months, target lesion primary patency at six and 12 months, and technical success. The study site was Singapore General Hospital, which does over 3,000 uh, salvage access for, for dysfunctional fistulas and grass per year. Uh, we enrolled 33 patients uh, from May 2019 to January 2020. The inclusion criteria included that they had to be, stenosis had to be initially treated with a high pressure plain balloon prior to SCB treatment. Therefore, no clinical significant dissection, residual stenosis less than 30%, and ability to completely efface the lesion using the pre-dilatation balloon. And basically, we allowed one additional uh, target lesion, uh, and we used the reference ves vessel diameters between 5 to 8 millimeters. Turning to patient demographics, you can see there are quite, uh, patients with multiple comorbidities. Mean age was around 65 years with a mean BMI of about 26. The majority of these patients were Chinese in origin. In terms of the types of AVF, the majority were radiocephalic and brachiocephalic fistulas. Over two thirds were recurrent lesions in nature. All of these fistulas were mature in origin and uh, no, we did not do this uh, for any immature fistulas. Turning to procedural uh, details, um, you can see that we uh, performed uh, angioplasty on 47 lesions and 33 subjects. Uh, the majority were for non juxtaanastomotic lesions and about 60%.
In terms of treatment outcomes, we gained 100% technical success rate and 100% freedom from device or procedure related mortality, which is our safety endpoint. Looking at six month patency, which has previously been uh, published, um, the primary circuit access patency was around 68%, with a target lesion primary patency rate of about 83%. The 12 month outcome, and this is probably the slide of interest for this talk, you can see that the primary circuit patency drops to about 45% uh, at 12 months. The target lesion primary patency also drops to 58%. Uh, the mean uh, target lesion revascularization free time was about 10 months, and the mean time to target lesion revascular reintervention was about 6.8 months. Looking at some of the subgroup work, you can see that there was really no difference between those who had a recurrent lesion or who had a, uh, a, or a de novo lesion. Um, the JAS lesions tended to fare worse in terms of uh, reintervention, but this was not significant. In terms of the reinterventions between the 6 and 12 months, you can see this, uh, 7 out of those 10 were actually for recurrent uh, lesions. Um, the mean number of interventions prior to the target procedure was about 2, and about 6 out of 7 had JAS uh, lesions. And these were restenotic in nature. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the Matilda study confirms excellent technical and clinical success rate using the uh, concept medical uh, Soromus coated balloon. It is safe. No serious adverse events were reported associated with its use. It is efficacious. The one-year target lesion primary patency based on duplex is comparable, if not superior, to the current paclitaxel data. And if you look at some of the meta-analyses, the one-year primary patency for paclitaxel uh, lesions is 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 less than uh, is less than what we have found in this study is approximately about fifty percent. However, we do need longer term data, and we do need RCTs to compare this both to plain angioplasty, which remains the gold standard for endovascular salvage, and we do need a head to head comparison between paclitaxel and serolimus in the AVF circuit. And in that, I leave, I'll hand you back to the floor, and I want to just thank my Matilda investigators for their kind participation. Thank you very much, June, for the uh, very interesting uh, presentation of your early data with the use of serolimus coded uh, balloons in the Matilda study. We move on now to Dr. Tan from Singapore as well. Dr. Tan will be presenting on the use of the magic touch for a slightly more complex clinical scenario, uh, especially in particular at the vein graft junction of thrombotic arteriovenous grafts. Dr. Tan, the podium is yours. Thank you for the invitation to share with you the one year outcome data on the use of serumous coated balloon at the graft vein junction in thrombose AVG. Uh, functioning access is critical to the delivery of life-saving hemodialysis therapy in patients with end-stage renal disease. However, new intermittent hyperplasia often occur within the dialysis circuit, resulting in stenosis, poor flow, and ultimately thrombosis of the circuit. The situation is worse in patients who have poor veins and requires AVG creation. New intermittent hyperplasia often occur at the gravin junction which can lead to stenosis and thrombosis of the AVG. Although we are able to successfully salvage thrombose AVG either through open or endovascular technique, the pregnancy rate after successful salvage therapy remains poor. Based on the literature, up to 50% of the patients who have undergone successful salvage therapy will be back again within three months. Seolomus coated balloon has been successfully used in coronary artery intervention by preventing new intermal hyperplasia in the arterial system. Compared to palataxia, which is the current drug-coated balloon in peripheral intervention, serolimus is cytostatic in its mode of action with a huge margin of safety. We therefore postulate that the application of serolimus coated balloon at the graving junction following successful endovascular thrombectomy will minimize new intermal hyperplasia 
and improve the patency of the AVG. Hence, we carry out a single-center prospective study of 20 patients who presented with thrombose AVG. Seromus coated balloon is applied at the graphene junction after successful endovascular salvage, and the patients will follow up at 3 and 6 months with duplex ultrasonography. The primary endpoint was set as the primary pregnancy rate of the AVG at 3 months, and the secondary endpoints were the pregnancy rate at 6 and 12 months. These are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Essentially, we only look at thrombose AVG in the upper limb, and patients with central vein stenosis or standard graphene junctions were excluded from the study. A total of 37 patients were screened and 20 patients were recruited over a one-year period. 17 patients were excluded because they had coexisting central vein stenosis, field thrombolysis, had residual stenosis or required stenting of the graphene junction. All 20 patients were follow up till AVG failure, death or 12 months. We have reported our 6-month data in JVIR recently. Between 6 and 12 months, an additional one patient passed away, and we had 6 patients whose AVG remained patent up to 1 year without the need for additional intervention. These are the baseline demographic data of the 20 patients that were recruited. The median age was 68 years old, with a predominant female population. The etiology of ESRD was diabetes mellitus and hypertension in majority of the patient, and up to 50% of them were on anti therapy prior to intervention. The median vintage of the AVG was 14.5 months and were predominantly in the upper arm. About a third of these patients had one to two intervention in the preceding 12 months before enrollment. TPA was the thrombolytic agent used in two thirds of the patient. 7mm high pressure balloon was the predominant balloon used to treat the culprit lesion, and cutting balloon had to be used in 20% of the patient. The size of the serumous balloon used ranges from 7 to 8mm. Most significantly, none of these patients had any significant residual stenosis or thrombus after the procedure. This is the result of our study. The primary pregnancy rate at 3 months was 76%, with 3 patients experiencing re-thrombosis within 90 days, and one had repeated angioplasty performed for low flow. Therefore, the primary assisted pregnancy at 3 months was 82%. Three patients exited the study due to complications before the 3-month primary endpoint. The complications were unrelated to the use of serumous coated balloon. One had surgical revision of the A-limb for pseudoaneurysm formation 8 days after successful thrombolysis. One passed away from intracranial hemorrhage, and one had explant of the AVG at day 88. Significantly, these three AVG were still patent at the time of event. The primary patency at six months was 65%, at two patients had rethrombosis of the excess at 134 and 157 days post intervention, respectively. This is how the Kepler Meyer curve looks like. The projected mean primary circuit pregnancy is 285 days. At 12 months, not unexpectedly, the primary circuit pregnancy decreased further to 37.5%. Only 16 patients reached the 12-month mark as one additional patient passed away 319 days post-procedure. This also illustrates the high risk of a dropout in studies involving end-stage renal failure patients. If we compare with the rest of the data in the literature with regards to the patency of AVG after successful salvage, we can see that the rates using serolimus coated balloon was significantly better than the reported patency rate using plain balloon angioplasty or palataxia coated balloon in our institution, even if you account for all the 20 patients that were recruited in the study. If we compare the 6-month sacred patency that was reported in the large randomized studies, with the use of cutting balloons and stand graph, the 6-month and 12-month circuit pregnancy appears to be quite good. However, we must bear in mind that our study population is very small and there is an inherent risk of selection bias in small study. In conclusion, our small pilot study suggests that serumous coated balloon may be effective in thrombose AVG 
bearing in mind that this is a group of patients that has one of the highest recurrence rate. It is important to treat the Garfield injunction adequately to ensure the effectiveness of seroimus in slowing down the process of neoidermal hyperplasia. Larger randomized studies are ongoing to verify our findings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan, for the very interesting presentation. I think now, June, the session is uh, open for questions. Uh, and now we come to the juicy part. What do you Thanks, think? Justice. Appreciate it. So uh, I'm very honored to actually be with you guys because you're all avid uh, serolimus users in the AVF. So let's just kick off with the, probably with you, Alok. Um, you are the biology man that give us plausibility. Um, you know, the biology of fistulas is very different from the other vasculature like de novo coronary or PAD or instant restenosis. Can you in a minute quickly summarize for me how you perceive these differences to impact the efficacy and how it may influence the design of serolimus coated balloons in terms of dosage and excipients? Uh, Alok, can you please unmute? Um, yeah, thanks. Am I, are you, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great, great, great question. I mean, I think the issue is of course, one of when you do an angioplasty on a vessel, you have a injury at one moment and then the injury is gone and you have that response to the specific injury that occurs over time. In a hemodynamic, a hemodialysis access graft, you have chronic constant injury, right? You've got shear stress, you've got high pressure into low st uh, pressure systems, you've got turbulent flow, all of that builds up to cause chronic injury over time. I think the AV fistula uh, situation is the hardest to solve in terms of patency. The issue becomes, how do you overcome that? I think you have to sustain serolimus release over time for long periods of time to really get good outcomes in these kind of graphs. Now, the issue, and I won't take forever, we don't have much time, but we can't really test in animal models the PK analysis for AV fistula graphs, because the in animals, the graphs only last about 60 days. So we can never draw out a full PK curve in this situation. And that's one of the limitations that we've got to uh, testing this kind of model in an animal model. Thanks for that. That's very interesting. Do you think that quickly, just a follow on, do you think the nano carriers from the serolimus coated balloons from Magic Touch, do they gonna give them an advantage to keep that uh, drug into the war or do you think uh, it will give the lasting effect? Because what we're losing, we're losing drug, aren't we actually uh, at the six to 12 month uh, uh, time yes, period? Aren't we, are we? Losing. we are losing drug. And we and remember I showed you that in a coronary model, not in an AV fistula model. So what, do we know what the PK is? No, I think we need to maximize sustained relief, uh, uh, release of the drug. The other issue becomes of course with, uh, uh, and Dr. Katsanos is well aware, AV fistula models are very close to the lung. You're gonna get drainage into the venous system and immediately into the lung. That's even more reason to be concerned about paclitaxel balloons in this situation. So I'm really more comfortable with serolimus in this situation, to be quite honest, even though it may or may not be as efficacious. Thanks, Alok. Let me go to Dr. Tan. Uh, very nice study, uh, and uh, I read that, very, that paper very well, actually. I thought it was very, very good results. But let me ask you, there is randomized evidence uh, that a covered stent behaves extremely better than plain balloon angioplasty at the vein graft stenosis in terms of synthetic grafts that you've shown us. Are you ready, therefore, with your results to move to serolimus coated balloons in that setting in that indication? A current gold standard treatment for thrombose graft or AVG dysfunction is still a covered stent. Covered stent has the advantage of uh, treating the acute elastic recoil that is often accounted during the treatment of this uh, of, uh, thrombose or stenotic AVG. However, in our study, we are not trying to replace graft, but we are trying to prove that by adequately treating the graft injunction, either through the use of high pressure balloon or cutting balloon, we can maintain the patency of the graft injunction with serolimus coated balloon. Because what we are doing is to slow down the the, the new internal hyperplasia that occurs after the treatment. So uh, I think we have uh, different roles. And of course, the ultimate aim of any angioplasty or endovascular treatment is to leave nothing behind. And hopefully that will be the, the dream that we can achieve one day. Okay, a little follow-on question there for uh, Milo. 
Um, there is some evidence that sirolimus is prothrombotic. We know that from the, some of the Conrad literature. So introducing this so early in a thrombotic ABG, do you think there's any evidence from your data to refute this? And what is your anticoagulation policy post uh, sirolimus mm. coated balloons in this setting? So when we first started the study in the ABG, one of the consideration was the optimal use of uh, antiplatelet therapy. Unfortunately, we have uh, no uh, clear answer. So we actually use dual antiplatelet therapy for this group of patients, these are uh, 20 patients that we started on. We do not see any uh, early rethrombosis uh, in the 20 patients that, uh, that we recruited. So I think the jury is still out there on what is the optimal treatment or optimal antiplatelet therapy. But bearing in mind the AVG, AVF situation is very different from the coronary system. We are dealing with 6 mm to 7 mm vessel versus the coronary system. So I do not, at this point in time in our small study, we have not noticed any uh, thrombot early thrombotic event post-intervention, uh, actually. Thanks for that. Can I encourage the audience to actually put in some questions? Uh, all of my questions are all lined up for these uh, experts. And uh, I'll just continue because of the time that we have. This one has gone to Dr. Kat Sanos. I always give him the most difficult questions in these, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, symposium. In terms of mechanistic action, therefore, Costas, uh, paclitaxel seems to work at the adventitial war level. And Sirolus has effects on all the layers, you know. And in fact, we've seen ectasia and aneurysm with paclitaxel in the periphery arteries. But there have also been reports of aneurysm and formation post-SCB in the coronary literature. What are the potential advantages of Sirolimus solution over paclitaxel, therefore, based on this observation? And how can we harness this effect better moving forward in the ABF setting? Well, thank you, June, uh, for, the, for the very, very long question. <laughs> The, uh, well, it is still early times uh, using Sirolimus in the arteriovenous fistula space. I think Dr. Finn very nicely highlighted uh, the differences between uh, cytotoxic paclitaxel and the cytostatic Sirolimus. So uh, the uh, mode of action is different. Um, indeed, we have seen ectasias, we have seen uh, local vessel toxicity with the use of paclitaxel in the peripheral arteries. I would still remind everybody that this is a different beast. I mean, in the fistula space, we've got all those uh, fibroblasts that are translocating from the adventitia and moving across the vessel wall layers, and they essentially become the myofibroblasts. And this is the myo intima that is being developing with all those recurrent stenosis. So uh, theoretically, uh, some kind of medication that spreads evenly and more uniformly across all three vessels so what layers like Sirolimus makes better sense. But again, contrary to Paclitaxel that has produced a number of positive randomized studies in the fistula space, we still haven't seen this level of evidence with Sirolimus. Uh, I still feel quite comfortable with Sirolimus, but I think it's still early times to tell what's how is this uh, space going to evolve in the future. Thanks for that. I've got a question from the audience here, Milo. Uh, from John Schultz from the US. Um, he's asked, well, what role should thrombectomy play in preparing the ABF lesion for drug-coated balloon? Quickly in about 10 seconds, so I can ask another question. You need to clear the clots, clear all the clots before you apply the balloon at the culprit lesion so that you can deliver the drug sufficiently and uh, adequately to the target lesion. Okay. That's 10 seconds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim <laughs> George. Uh, Costas, quickly. Um, I think time actually may be running here. What is your protocol on using DCBs in the AVF dysfunction? Uh, uh, sorry, say again, in the, in the AVF? I think we've actually run out of time here. Okay, I'm going to... I'm going to hold on to that question for the next time, and perhaps uh, we can answer that uh, on, uh, online. Uh, I would like to thank everybody. I would like to thank Concept Medical for sponsoring this event. Uh, I would like to thank my esteemed speakers. And once again, I hope you have enjoyed this session. Good afternoon, good morning across the US, uh, and good evening uh, back to you uh, in Singapore, Dr. Tang and Dr. Uh, Dr. June. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.